Hannibal. It's a name that conjures images for you, isn't it? You're probably thinking of the main bad guy, the protagonist from the Silence of the Lambs series, Hannibal Lecter. But did you know that he's actually named after a historical figure? Hannibal was also the name of the main general of the Carthaginian Empire. Now, who, who was that and, and where were they? Well, Carthage was a city in northern Africa, in what today is present-day Tunisia. But the Carthaginians and their empire was the main rival to Rome when it was still kind of in its infancy, not really having spread out from Italy. And it wasn't a sure thing. Who was going to rule the Mediterranean Sea? Well, the Carthaginians had Hannibal, and he was a brilliant military general. In what's known as the First Punic War, he marched his army west across northern Africa, across the Straits of Gibraltar, through Spain and Italy, or southern France, uh, then through the Italian Alps and into Italy, all with a massive army, a huge logistical undertaking, and strangely enough to the Romans, even war elephants, if you can picture those marching through the Italian Alps. Well, Hannibal was so successful in his first military campaign, known as the Punic, First Punic War, that there he created a reign of terror over the Italian peninsula for 15 years on end. It took a long time for the Romans to drive him out. Well, it didn't last forever. There was a second Punic War and a third Punic War, and at times it would seem like it would go either way. Carthage, the, the mean, the capital of the Carthaginian Empire, was a formidable fortress city. They had thick walls surrounding the city, 33 kilometers of walls around the city, sometimes over 40 feet high and over 35 feet thick. Huge walls, and, and the city seemed impregnable. How could Rome possibly hope to conquer it? Well, as much as... Uh, they were very much the, the, the chief rival of Rome. They were brought low, of course. Carthage, the, the capital city of the empire, was destroyed by a Roman general in the Third Punic War in the year 146 BC. Carthage had been this thriving metropolis of a city, and it was brought down. And, and not just defeated, not just some of its key people taken away, but we are talking utter destruction. The Carthaginian navy was brought into the harbor of Carthage just so that the citizens of that city could watch it burn by the Roman navy. And then the Roman army went into the city itself and went house by house, dragging the inhabitants from it. Anyone who had not yet fled to the desert was taken as a slave, and over 50,000 people were sold because from that one city into slavery. But removing the people was not enough. They, the, the people of Rome saw that Carthage itself, just as a, as a geographical location, had to be wiped out. One Roman governor said repeatedly, in, in any speech he would make before the Senate, Carthage must be destroyed. Over and over again, even if he was talking about some some sewer pipe that needed to be put in Rome. He would give his speech on that and he would end it always with, Carthage must be destroyed. And so it was. The houses were torn down, the, the walls decimated, so that all that was left of the city was just rubble and ruin. They went so far, in fact, as to plow up all the fields, uh, farm fields around the, the city and sow them with salt so that even the ground itself would not yield food for anybody who wished to rebuild there. Carthage was made a total ruin. It's a stunning picture. We, we don't have really any easy equivalents in our day and age, militarily, to, to such devastation. But the truth is that these things have and, and do continue to happen. And in fact, that they're not just sometimes allowed by God to happen. He, in fact, instigates them himself. And that's what our final chapter, chapter 9 in the book of Amos is about, that, that God can make ruins, even of the nation of Israel. It, it's been a, a book of bad news, a prof, continual prophecy of warning of coming destruction. 
and the final chapter is in some ways no different, though we're going to find out there is a bit of a twist. And, and the first twist is going to come for us in verse 7. So let's, let's read through the first seven verses together, shall we? Amos chapter 9, beginning at verse 1. I saw the Lord standing by the altar, and he said, Strike the tops of the pillars so that the thresholds shake. Bring them down on the heads of all the people. Those who are left, I will kill with the sword. Not one will get away. None will escape. Though they dig down to the depths below, from there my hand will take them. Though they climb up to heaven above, from there I will bring them down. Though they hide themselves on top of Carmel, there I will hunt them down and seize them. Though they hide from my eyes at the bottom of the sea, there I will command the serpent to bite them. Though they are driven into exile by their enemies, there I will command the sword to slay them. I will keep my eye on them for harm and not for good. The Lord, the Lord Almighty, he touches the earth and it melts. And all who live in it mourn. The whole land rises up like the Nile, then sinks like the river of Egypt. He builds his lofty palace in the heavens and sets its foundation on the earth. He calls for the waters of the sea and pours them out over the face of the earth. The Lord is his name. Are not you Israelites the same to me as the Cushites, declares the Lord? Did not I bring up Israel from Egypt, the Philistines from Kaftor, and the Arameans from Kerr? There's a lot packed in those first few verses, but it's obvious that, that God is intending judgment on Israel, destruction, and no one will be able to escape. He's going to make a ruin of the nation of Israel. And so it begins with a vision of the Lord standing by the altar. This is likely the main worship center, at the southern one in the nation of Israel, at Beersheba. And he says he's going to, to strike the pillars and, and shake it in such a way that the whole temple and worship complex comes falling down on the heads of the people there. We mentioned last week in chapter 8 that there was some uh, allusion to a possible earthquake. And this, this is really the most explicit uh, reference to it, foretelling of this terrible earthquake that's going to cause all this damage in Samaria and all of the nation of Israel. And, and in fact, if we go back to chapter 1, you'll remember the book, the, the prophecy is dated according to this natural disaster. But Amos' point is not just that an earthquake is coming, but that no one is going to escape. No matter where they go. Verse 2 says they can dig down to the depths below. And, and the NIV isn't maybe a, a really explicit translation here, but that word is Sheol. Some of you may remember it as the Hebrew term for the realm of the dead. They can go right down below. Uh, under the earth, down to the realm of the dead, or they can go up to heaven, and they will not escape God. Geographically, they could go as far as the top of Mount Carmel, one of the highest and most remote uh, locations in Israel, full of caves and great places to hide out. God will find them there. And he lists other locations as well that, that the Israelites will not be able to flee to. And finally, he sums it up by saying, I will keep my eye on them for harm and not for good. And we've been, we've been noticing uh, the book of Deuteronomy it keeps creeping up in, in the prophecy of Amos, and this is no different. This is, in fact, uh, words taken directly from Deuteronomy 30 and 31, but Amos flips them on their head. This is, this is actually, this phrase is actually uh, meant to be a blessing. In Deuteronomy, it says, I will keep my eye on them for good and not for harm. This is to be one of the blessings that comes through their obedience to the covenant. But Amos says, no, you've been disobedient, and he flips those words on, on their head. And, and it should be startling to the people of Israel. What should be surprising as well, or even a bit ironic, is, is what comes in verses 5 and 6. It's actually, we think, a hymn that would have been sung in worship to God at, at the temple proper. And, and Amos includes it here in this prophecy to say, you know who God is. You've been singing about him all the time, that, that he's Lord over all creation, and he can do anything he wants. He's all-powerful. And so why would you think that he can't act against you? That he's holy and seated up in the heavens. His ways are above our ways. 
And, and just imagine if you were being brought before God's judgment throne and, and some aspect of his character you had overlooked was actually something you'd been singing about week to week, day in and day out. That the, the truth had been staring you in the face the whole time and you just, you'd missed it. I think it's easy for us as God's people in whatever age to be complacent in our knowledge of God. To, to sing great songs and, and become accustomed to the, the words and the truths therein not realize that when we sing that, we are in God's presence. That, that there is a God in heaven who hears, and, and that, that describes him, and, and he's a reality to us. We have to always be not just aware of that, but living in such a way that, that it shows. But then, truly surprising is verse 7, where Amos compares the Israelites to the Cushites, that is, the inhabitants of Ethiopia. Or the Philistines, their mortal enemies. Or the Arameans to the north, their on and off again allies. And he says, you're actually pretty similar to them. You've all had Exodus experiences. You've been in one place, and God has drawn you from there and placed you in another. This would have been a radical thought to the Israelites. That, that God would compare them to other nations and say, you're just the same. What God is telling them is their past that they rely so much on and to say, oh, well, God saved us through the Exodus and we had Mount Sinai. We have all this shared history with God. We can just rest on that. He wouldn't do anything to us now. And God says, no, no. Your, your Exodus experience is quite similar to other people. It's not on the base of your, basis of your experience that God relates to you. It's on the basis of the present. And that's a good word for us as well, as Christians. Again, we're, we're brought into this present moment. I, I think as Christians, we, we like to coast. I know I do from time to time. I like to think, well, I had a really good week of uh, prayer and devotions last week. And so I, I can take it easy this week. I, maybe I don't have to be quite so rigor with, rigorous with it. Or I get this a lot as a pastor. Oh, pastor, you know, I've been going to church for years and years, and I, and I really, there's not a lot new that you could say to me. <laughs> or, or people wanting to bring up their credentials. You know, I helped with the youth group for, for 10 years probably, and so that's why I don't really show up to church anymore. Quit trying to convince me. Talk to God. And, and don't say, oh, I had that conversation. Talk to God now. Our, our relationship with God is always held in the only time we have, the present. The right now. We can't expect to just kind of sail through life on, on the coattails of some previous religious experience. God wants us here and now to relate to him. But what I think Amos is saying to the people of Israel is God's not playing favorites. That, that there is in some sense a uh, an ownership that God places on every single human being on the earth. And that, that would have been a radical thought. That, that would have uh, been a very strange idea to them. It's so ingrained in their identity that they were God's special possession that, that, that was so miles above anybody else, that, that anybody else was almost subhuman in a way and didn't need to be cared for. And God is saying, no, it actually... You've got more in common with your neighbors than you think. God doesn't play favorites. And I think of a man who uh, didn't want to play favorites either, but he had to call one or the other of his children. He lived in New York, and so uh, it was around Thanksgiving time. He had, he had some bad news for, for his two kids, and so he called, decided to call his son first, who was in Chicago. He says, son, uh, I've got... Some bad news, thinking of ruins, I guess is what brought it to mind. He says, uh, I, I don't want to ruin your day, but um, your mother and I are going to get a divorce. Uh, 45 years of misery has just finally taken its toll on us. And his, his son is shocked. It's just a, a bolt from the blue, as it were. And uh, he says, no, no, Dad, what are you talking about? How, how can you be saying this? This is crazy. He's, he says, no, 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 we've, we've really talked it through, and so uh, I don't want you to, to fret about it, but 
I, and now I, I don't want to play favorites, but I really, we've talked about it so much. I, I don't feel like contacting your sister. So could you call her for me and, and let her know this, uh, this bad news? So I said, okay, okay, uh, but don't do anything about it right now. Just let me talk to her first and, and we'll see see what uh, what can be done. So he calls up his sister who lives in Phoenix. So they're quite spread out across the country. And tells his sister and his sister says, what? And, and blows up and says, no, 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 no. We're, we're going to talk them out of this, in fact. I'm going to get on a, a plane here and I'm going to uh, be there for the, this coming Thanksgiving weekend. We'll have the long weekend to talk them out of this and, and get some sense into their heads. And you be there too. And so the son says, yeah, okay, and gets off the phone, calls up his dad, says, we're both going to be there this weekend. Well, we, need to, we need to hash this thing through. Uh, you, you can't make such a hasty decision. This is preposterous. Hangs up the phone. The, the dad says to his wife, he says, honey, I got both the kids to come home for Thanksgiving, and they're play, paying their own airplane ticket. Uh, but what are we going to do about Christmas? Okay, kind of a ridiculous story. But the point is, you know, he wasn't playing favorites. He, he didn't want one or the other necessarily to come home So He wanted them both. And, and that's the point that, that God's trying to make to Israel. It's, it's not as though he wants just Israel, the exclusion of all other nations. And we're going to see in the next passage that, that his plan is not just to make a ruin of Israel, but it's also to restore them and through Israel to bless all nations. So let's pick up the prophecy at verse 8. Surely the eyes of the Sovereign Lord are on the sinful kingdom. I will destroy it from the face of the earth. Yet, I will not totally destroy the descendants of Jacob, declares the Lord. For I will give the command, and I will shake the people of Israel among all the nations, as grain is shaken in a sieve, and not a pebble will reach the ground. All the sinners among my people will die by the sword. All those who say disaster cannot overtake us or meet us. In that day, I will restore David's fallen shelter. I will repair its broken walls and restore its ruins. And will rebuild it as it used to be so that they may possess the remnant of Edom and all the nations that bear my name, says, declares the Lord, who will do these things. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when the reaper will be overtaken by the plowman and, and the planter by the one trading grapes. New wine will drip from the mountains and flow from all the hills, and I will bring my people Israel back from exile. They will rebuild the ruined cities and live in them. They will plant vineyards and drink their wine. They will make gardens and eat their fruit. I will plant Israel in their own land, never again to be uprooted from the land I have given them says the Lord your God. God can make ruins, but he can restore them too. That's the, the good news we read at the end of the book of Amos. And, and a hopeful note, not just for the nation of Israel, but even broader than that. But we read those verses in, in verse 8, especially you know, the eyes of the sovereign Lord are on the sinful kingdom. And that's what a powerful term for, for how far Israel has tread from the path that God had laid out for them. But he further says, I will destroy it from the face of earth, the earth, yet I will not totally destroy the descendants of Jacob. So we're finding out a bit more explicit detail here, that, that it's this idea of a nation of Israel that God is going to obliterate. He's not going to destroy every single individual Israelite. And this very much comes to pass. The, the nation of Assyria comes to invade uh, the nation of Israel. And later Babylon, when they invade Judah, th their idea is to kind of keep cohesive national identity among its people. And so even if they're pulled into exile, they're kept in a, in a group. But the Assyrians who invade Israel do not. They, their idea is to destroy national identity, and they spread the remnant of Israel out to sort of the four corners of their empire. The this identity as an Israelite uh, of the kingdom of Israel is demolished. And though much later when the Syrians are taken over by the Babylonians, are taken over by the Persians, and Cyrus I allows the people of Judah to return to their nation, to Jerusalem, to rebuild the temple and, and the city walls. At that point, some of these Assyrian refugees will stream back to, to Judah 
but it's really just going to be people that really want to worship God at that point. And so in a sense, the exile, the judgment that God brings on his people does exactly what he had described it would do. It's going to sift them like wheat. It's going to get all the pebbles and the chaff out, and it's just going to be this faithful remnant that returns to Jerusalem. But there's more to this as well. Verses uh, 11 15 to 15 give us an incredibly hopeful message at the end of the book of, Isaiah, of Amos that, that God is going to make a ruin of Israel, but he's going to one day restore as well. And he does it in such language that it should give us as Christians, not Israelites, but Christians, hope. He says specifically, I will restore David's fallen tent, the fallen shelter, as the NIV puts it. The, the idea there is that like David's house, though fragile and, and wobbling from good to bad king right now in, in the uh, kingdom of Judah, is going to be restored and given a place of prominence. And of course, we see that fulfillment in the New Testament in the person of Jesus. Well, several gospel writers know that this is an important element, and that's why they give us Jesus' genealogy to show his descendant, descendants from the line of David. And then, of course, Jesus' own words echo this this verse as well. It says, I will repair its broken walls and restore its ruins and will rebuild it as it used to be. Destroy this temple, he says to the Pharisees, and I will rebuild it in three days. But he's not speaking about the temple proper, the building. He's talking about his own body. And, and, And it's on him that the church, on that cornerstone, on that foundation of Jesus Christ, that the church is built and that is the people of God made anew. And, and so it's, it's these words of Amos in chapter 9, verses 11 and 12 that give us hope. And, and 12 especially becomes incredibly significant, not just in ter- light of Jesus' work, but becomes pivotal for the early church as well. Verse 12, of course, says, so that This will happen so that they, the Israelites, may possess the remnant of Edom, And all the nations that bear my name, declares the Lord, who will do these things. All the nations that bear my name. Again, a a radical idea. The nation of Israel would have said, well, we're the ones that bear your name. Maybe Judah to the south, we might include them too if we're feeling generous. But surely not Edom, surely not Ammon, surely not the Philistines, our bitter enemies. God says, no, all these nations bear my name. They have their my mark upon them. And it's this verse in particular that in Acts chapter 15, the early church looks at and says, when trying to decide, do, do people coming into the church need to become Israelites first, that is Jews, and be accepted into Jewish religion before they can become Christians? Or is the way of salvation open to all people on earth? Every nation essentially being recognized as bearing God's stamp. And the early church says, yes, God's grace is for everyone. There's no race of people that is so far from God that they can't be brought in. There's no people who have sinned so incredibly that they have to somehow reform before God can accept them. It's simply through the act of repentance and placing our faith in the the finished work of Jesus Christ, his sacrifice for us, that we are all bestowed grace upon grace. And that's something that's strange and wonderful and and amazing and worth celebrating. And it gives us hope. The the picture that Amos gives us is is agricultural hope, interestingly. And and that's sort of a, a promise that's embedded, again, back in the book of Deuteronomy, that is God's people uh, flourish in in their relationship with him, in their obedience of his word, he will make their land flourish as well. And, you know, the picture of the the reaper being overtaken by the plowman in this country it kind of makes sense. We grow a lot of wheat crops here. Grapes might be a little harder for us to picture, but they were uh, usually harvested around August into September sometime. And then the new plantings of the new vines would go in sometime in November, to catch, capture the, uh, the winter rains in Israel. But just imagine for a moment that 
that the harvest comes on so plentifully that you begin harvesting your grapes in August. And by November, you're still not done. You're still treading the grapes in the wine press. Meanwhile, the fields need to be planted. It's just a, such a startling picture of abundance. And, and, and Amos talks about wine dripping from the mountains and flowing down the hills. And, and this is this is an almost preposterous picture in, in Palestine because it's it's a very arid country. There's not a lot of water uh, to be spread around. And so, so it's a startling image. It, it's, it's, it's joyful in its abundance for the people of God. And, and it's just that kind of abundance of hope that God wants to instill in us too. Then we are, as God's people, looking forward to something even greater, the return of Christ, the, the second coming, when all of creation, heaven and earth, are made entirely new. Not just our, our farmer's fields and, and the work of our hands, but our relationships, our inward beings are restored in a mind-boggling way from the ruin that they might have been. That out of darkness, God is going to create light. Out of despair is going to come hope. Out of death is going to spring life. God certainly does make ruins, but even more certainly, He can restore them in, into something flourishing and amazing. And, and it happens all the time. We, we see God at work in people's lives, and sometimes it's easy to breeze past because we don't realize just how profound a change. Has taken place. It happened for Carthage too. You know, we started uh, there this morning, and the city of Carthage actually, it didn't take long for it to be turned around. It sounds sounds kind of dramatic that every stone, every building should be pulled apart and, and salt put into the ground. But it was a bare hundred years later that none other than Julius Caesar came and decided they tried having some other capitals in North Africa in the. Roman Empire, and it just wasn't working out, and they thought, you know what, Carthage is just the natural place to have it, and he rebuilt the city. By Jesus' time, in the western half of the empire, Carthage became sort of the second city of the empire there, second only to Rome. At its peak, there was half a million people living in Carthage, uh, and, and North Africa became the breadbasket of the empire, providing food to many different regions within the Roman Empire, it, and, and not just in terms of agriculture, but it was a, had a rich intellectual and spiritual life. In fact, Carthage in the early church would become a, a, an epicenter of Christian thought and philosophy and theology. Of course, St. Augustine is from there. And in fact, the Bible we read, the, the books in it were confirmed in no, no other place than Carthage, the spot that had been devastated, flattened, and turned into a ruin, it sprung up to new life again. And, and I think just as amazing a, a picture can happen in our lives, in, and we can hold on to the hope that it can happen in the lives of our family, too, who don't know Christ, who, who need hope and resurrection in their own lives. I want to read you a quote from Eric Liddell, the famous missionary and, and in a way, maybe more famous Olympic runner. Uh, made famous the uh, movie Chariots of Fire. Circumstances may appear to wreck our lives and God's plans, but God is not helpless among the ruins. Our broken lives are not lost or useless. God's love is still working. He comes in and takes the calamity and uses it victoriously, working out his wonderful plan of love. You might feel like your life is a bit of a picture of devastation right now. Maybe it's just simply this isolation with the coronavirus. Maybe it's other things that are going on, health challenges, problems with your family. Um, whatever's going on in your life, we know that, that ruins happen, that, that devastation happens in our lives. But we also know as God's people that we can take that to him and that he can take the ruin of our life and restore, that, that he can create, take defeat and turn that into victory in some glorious way. 
And I guess our question this morning is, are you going to let him? Sometimes we like to hang on to our defeat, our, our sadness, our, our, our sin even, the things that are holding us back from having a deeper relationship with God, plunging further into his holiness. And the question is, are we going to let go of them? Are we going to leave our ruins, walk out and, and let God restore our life in new and profound ways? What's the sin that's holding you back? God can make further ruins in our lives if he needs to. You know, he, he will bring us as low as necessary so that he can restore us, so that we can see our need for him and, and the real life that we can have in Jesus, Jesus Christ. Be confident of that, that God can make a ruin, that, that we may not be having prophets coming and speaking words of warning to us, but, but God is always offering us this invitation to a deeper life of his, an experience of his grace and that we need to to walk out of the ruins and, and let him restore our lives instead will you this morning will you this week will you will you respond in hope and, and take a message of hope for people that need to hear it as well your neighbors your friends your co-workers let's pray lord thank you that that in warnings we hear your rebuke we we hear you trying to turn us from the error of our ways lord and and thank you that your word to us is not just doom and gloom but it's gospel it's good news that that you have given us reason to hope as well that that whether the ruin of our life is your doing or ours or maybe even satan's lord that you want to take it and make something beautiful grow again in it and so we we cherish that hope, Lord. We look forward to that day where, where we see you again face to face, where you come again, where you make all things new, Lord. And, and we want to say here and now in this moment, Lord, do that. Do that in our inmost beings. Begin that work already, which you long to see accomplished in all the world. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 